Okay, seven o'clock, so welcome. Uh, please, you could join us um, for our very first webinar for 2021, TI Technology Resources for a Successful Back to School, and Peter Fox will be our presenter this evening. Uh, good evening, Peter. Hello, Brian, how are you? Yeah, I'm just living the dream, mate. And I, I can see that you've, uh, you've got a lot of uh, resources to share here. Successful back to school. I'm hoping that our uh, that our participants have already are already enjoying that, and that we might be able to make that just a little bit uh, just a little bit better for them. Uh, now I know Peter will be showing you some of the terrific things that is on the Texas Instruments Australia website, and no better person than Peter to show that to you. As you can see there, he he is the uh, he is the manager of that website. So uh, terrific to have you once again here, Peter. I'm in the background, um, just sort of uh, checking the chat. We can see that nicely. I'm going to take a quick tour of the website with regards to the sorts of areas that teachers can hone in on. Um, we'll spend about five minutes touring some of those things to see what they are, and then we'll get stuck into some maths. I guess that why we're here. Or some STEM. I guess part of it's up to you. Our audience, if they've got a particular interest out of the ones that I show you, if they want to know more, then you can put a request in to Brian and say, hey, get Peter to do the recognition program. I've never heard of it. Or um, what are these student tutorials? Or, oh, I didn't know there was an Australian curriculum section. So if there's particular ones that you want to jump to, this thing is dynamic, we can move it to the way you want. So the senior curriculum inspirations, uh, there's hundreds of free lessons in there. Uh, the activities include student question sheets, teacher notes, and, of course, answers. We've done them for you as well. Uh, so perhaps don't direct your students to that space. Um, and you can filter things by state, by subject, by year level, and the area of study to which is relevant. For those people joining us from Queensland, you'll see that there's two sections for you guys. There's one for people using Inspire and one for people using the TI-84. So we haven't left anyone out. Uh, the next thing we'll have a look at is the student tutorials. During uh, last year in particular, we decided that we'd help teachers out to a certain extent, and we had, I think, somewhere of the order of 10,000 engagements in our program through our YouTube channel and our live events. So we've put a whole stack of tutorials up there. They're aimed for students, so they're delivered in such a way as we're covering the mathematical content and showing the kids how to use their calculator at the same time. If you want to use them, they also have question sheets. So the idea is the students can just download the question sheet, do it, and if they don't have any questions, they don't have to watch the tutorial. Um, some of them also have uh, revision sheets as well. So in other words, you can watch the tutorial, see how to answer the questions, and follow along, pause it as you, as you like, because it's a recording, um, and then when you're done, download the question sheet or the revision sheet and see if you can do similar questions because they've got answers on them. So there's question sheets, there's revision sheets, there's tutorials, how to make the most of your calculator. So we had thousands and thousands of students engaging with us last year. I would have thought they'd be a bit tired of online learning, but apparently not. All right. The recognition program is something we launched last year, so if you'd like more details about that, put something in the chat and we'll see if we can get around to covering that, if that's one of the priorities. Basically, we decided that um, the volume purchase program, which we had, was difficult for teachers to access. We were basically locked down here in Victoria. So we decided, let's give teachers software. And it was so successful, we've continued it this year, um, which means basically your school can get free software licenses for all your maths teachers. Um, so if you're using Inspire, you get the Inspire software. If you're using 84s, you get that software. And even the little green calculator at TI-30, you can get that software as well. There's PD programs, free PD. You can even get a student license on your server. And, of course, lots of activities. So recognition program, check that one out. If you haven't been on YouTube, I suggest you go on and have a look at our YouTube channel. There's a range of things. There's mathematical content. There's also ones where if you want to know how we make some of these really cool diagrams that you see in some of the activities, there's a few videos on that too. You can also email us and say, how did you do this? 
So one of the people watching one of our videos, for example, they said, how did you make that Ferris wheel where it was graphing and doing everything at the same time, or the bicycle wheel, and it looked as though the spokes were rotating? So we made a video on it, showing people how to do it. The usual, you know, minimum um, uh, perimeter of a fixed, oh, sorry, minimum area or maximum area of a rectangle with fixed perimeter. How do you do that as a dynamic one? And there's a tutorial on that. And of course, they're all free to watch. Uh, STEM resources for those schools pushing along with STEM. We have got a stack of resources. You'll find them also embedded in our Australian curriculum site, but specific activities um, in the STEM pages. And just over the last couple of days, I, I decided I would build, get this, a spirograph generator using TI Innovator. So you can have your calculator generate a physical spirograph like the old ones for all of us older teachers, older types out there. Um, so Innovator chugs away and draws a graph. That's kind of cool. Well, like that spirograph. Um, 10 minutes of code. Now there's a new section. So if you're not up to date with your latest operating system, this is only for the Inspire users, unfortunately. The 84 doesn't have Python. But the TI Inspire CX2 now has Python as a programming language. So you've got a choice of Lua, TI Basic, or Python. And there's free lessons on our website if you're interested in learning how to do Python, uh, or if your students are interested in learning how to do Python. There's a teacher's lounge, doesn't serve any coffee, um, but it gives you all sorts of suggestions on how you can use the lessons. And of course, there's uh, student section as well. And almost to the end here of our little carousel, the Australian Curriculum Resources, they're specifically for Inspire uh, because we've found that Inspire tends to go all the way down into Year 7. There's a lot of schools starting it um, all the way down there. And of course now you've got the option through the recognition program to get the Inspire software on your server. Um, so you can have your junior school students using Inspire and getting familiar with that environment. So that was a lot to get through. So it's time to have a look at some of the content. I'm going to start with the Senior Curriculum one because I sort of threw that out there in the chat as we started. So let's jump onto that one. And basically this first one is called Personal Polynomials. This was one given to me last year and said, hey, have you done this activity? And I quite liked it. So basically each letter of your name is assigned a value. A is one, B is two, and so on. And the idea is you can write your first name or an abbreviation if you've got a really long name. And the first letter starts at one, and then obviously the second letter is number two, point two, and point three, and so on. And each letter is aligned to a number. So let's have a look. There's the letters of the alphabet in case you didn't remember them. So for example, my name as I put in the chat, Peter, and I just abbreviated it to Pete, means that um, my first point goes through 116. E is the second letter of my name, so it goes through the point 25, and then 320, and then 45. So it kind of looks like this. And hopefully, and someone can put it in the chat if they like, what's the smallest degree polynomial that I could create to go through all of those points? See if anyone's got any answer. Has anyone typed in an answer, Brian? How quick are they? Oh, they're pretty slow there, Peter. I would have thought that oh, would be an easy yeah. question, but lots of, lots of uh, participants online. Uh, maybe they don't yeah. understand. Yes, thank you. Uh, we, we've got one. We've got, uh, yeah, got a couple there now. All right. What, what are they thinking, Brian? Um, well, we've got three. Well, that's kind of cool because it's a polynomial degree three. If we've got three answers in already. So this one would be a polynomial degree mm -hmm. three. Now, if you're using Inspire CAS, then you could just do solve. You could define your polynomial and just hit solve, and it will give you all the coefficients. If you're using the non-CAS, how could you do it? Or if you're using an 84? And this activity, by the way, has been set up for 
Inspire CAS, Inspire Non-CAS, and TI-84 users. And yes, the teacher stuff comes with the answers. So you can just type the student's name in and it will give you the answer. So you don't have to do all the work. The students do, but so don't give that file to the kids. <laughs> it's kind of going to waste some of the time. So yes, we'll assume it's cubic. So therefore, we know that F1 would go through A times X to the power of 3, in other words, A, times B, or plus B times X squared, so it's just B, and so on. And F2, substituting in, obviously, X cubed, gives me an 8 and an X squared. So there's our second equation, and our third, and our fourth. So on our CAS, we just type solve, F1 equals 16, F2 equals 5, and so on, and we get A, B, C, and D. So how do you do it on a non-CAS? We well, put it in a matrix. And any clues, Brian? What would I do with that matrix now that I've set it up like that? Putting Brian on the spot here. He's probably busy typing stuff into the chat, are you? I was actually trying to set up a poll there, Peter, but the... Uh the oh, light pole sorry, um, <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give the answer. <laughs> Row reduction echelon form. And if you've never used it, it's a great little tool, and it will suddenly pop out a response that looks like that. That tells me that A is equal to negative 28 over 3, B is equal to 69, C is equal to negative 458 over 3, and D is equal to 109. So you can go for a pretty high polynomial because um, these things go up to 10 by 10 matrices, so um, we can get up to polynomial, given that we've got another column in the right. I'm thinking about a polynomial degree 8 is no problem at all, but I think that's what we on what most people would cover. Um, all right, so... And well done, Jeff. Jeff was a step ahead of you there. Peter? Oh, he'd done it already. He, he had the... RREF in the... Yep. Uh, RREF in the chat. Well done. Well done, Jeff. All right, so that's what my polynomial looks like. You guys should try and have a graph of your own ones. Um, and, but you're going to see it goes way beyond what's happening here. So let's have a look at my surname. I'm lucky I've just got a fairly short surname. What do we think, folks? Is this a polynomial degree 2? Is that what we're looking at? FOX. Hmm. It would seem reasonable, wouldn't it? Three points to pass through. So we can set it up the same way. Um, we'll assume it's quadratic. Yeah. Do you want to say something, Brian? Or have you I'm, I'm like looking it? at your, I have. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at your... Uh, oh, no, 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 we should be right. You, you're going... You, you're going to say something. So oh, my, I, I was um, looking at 163324, three, but no, we'll be right. Yep. And check this out. When I um, get the row, oh, look at that. What happened to the A? Row reduction says zero. Has it failed? This says the equation equals x, I'm oh, sorry, 9x minus 3. It says it's linear. Gradient of 9. And if you have a look, my name's kind of unique. Not that you'd know that, there's plenty of foxes around, but if you have a look, it's going up by a constant amount. So my fox is actually a linear function. So, well, it's either boring or it's kind of cool because it's unique. But let's have a look at some of the other questions that are in this activity. Um, obviously, we want the kids to locate axis intercepts, and if bisection method is part of your curriculum, there's instructions on how to write a program on the bisection method uh, to keep kids aware of it. So we go beyond just doing the, the graphing stuff. Um, but here's some interesting names. Hannah. What do you notice, that, notice about that name, Brian? Um, I would think we're, um, what's the word, palindromic? That is very good. So... It's interesting that it's a palindromic name because that actually can, and I won't say must, can change the degree of a polynomial. But it also gives us a polynomial that's very symmetrical, as you would expect. And then we might want to compare that to Anna, x minus 1. 
So in other words, let's shift Anna off to the right and we see that that picks up the middle of Hannah's name. So how close are they? Are they exactly the same in that region? Which then, of course, poses a question. Is your name kind of like a DNA graphical fingerprint or is it possible that two people with different names could potentially have parts of the same polynomial or even the whole polynomial the same? You'd, you'd automatically say no at the start, but beware. Um, and also suggest names where name of x equals zero has no solution. So in other words, names that do not pass through the x-axis, which kind of sucks if you need to do the bisection method. But there's a tip in there. If you've got a student whose name does not go through the x-axis, then it says, well, try passing through the line x uh, y equals 10 and get them to do that. Then they just have to think, oh, I need to translate my function and then I could use bisection method. And of course, we include some coding in there as well. So to give you a quick idea um, what it looks like, um, let's have a look. My Polly, and let's do Brian. There's your polynomial, Brian. A very handsome polynomial indeed. I know, right? And there it is on the graph. And it's just as quick if you're doing this on the 84. You run the little program and you type your name in and it tells you what your polynomial is. And it graphs it for you instantly. That, that took some doing, I can tell you, because the 84 is not native to text, whereas these things are. Now, I saw some other names on there. Let's have a look. I saw a guy by the name of Craig out there. Let's have a look at what his polynomial looks like. Oh, there we go. That's Craig. Now, did anyone have any specific requests of where they'd like to jump into? Or I can just mosey on along into the Australian curriculum section. I was I was endeavouring to set that up in the poll, Peter. Uh, but oh, I, I'm sorry. That function's not working. Um, so. Uh, yeah, let's just throw it up, throw it open to the participants. Type what you want into the uh, into the chat box. We'll see what we get. Um, well, while we're waiting for them to come in, um, let's have a look at parabolas. So they can type in what they want to see next. It depends on how much they can memorise from the previous screen, I guess. Um, introduction to parabolas. So there's an activity which you can download from the website, and I'm actually going to download this one from the website and show people how that's done. Um, it starts off with a paper folding activity to understand some of the geometry surrounding parameters, uh, parabolas. So it's not just all about pressing buttons on a calculator and typing in y equals x squared. There's a lot more to it. Um, the next stage of the activity looks at um, physically generating a uh, parabola based on its formal definition. And there's some algebraic, geometrical, and visual representation. There's even an activity, a physical activity, that students do. So Here's our part one, and they get this funny kind of paper folding thing. So you fold the paper up and it creates an envelope. Let's have a look. I could click on there, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump out of here and go on to the Australian website. Now, can you see the Australian website there on my screen, Brian? Yes, we can. Uh, and that's actually one of the things that uh, our participants asked for. So we're, we're interested in the lesson plans, Peter, and also there's interest for particularly the student resources. So uh, I think my, my favourite tab on that on that web page is the teachers tab, but uh, my second favourite is the students tab. All right. Well, let's have a look at the introduction to Prevalers. So. If we're thinking maybe year 10, number and algebra, and patterns and algebra. Scroll down. And these ones that look like this, they're assessments. So they're like mini tests. You can have them as a PDF, or if you're using Navigator, then you can send them out and the software will mark the test for you. So introduction to parabolas, there it is. There's a little animation kind of giving away what's going to happen. You can see teacher notes and answers. There's a teacher inspire, inspire file. That's because it's got some demonstration stuff in it. And there's a student TI inspire file. I'm going to jump on the teacher one. 
And you see, all I'm doing is clicking on it and it downloads. And then when I open it, that's it. That's how tricky it is to get this stuff on your computer. You just click download and then click on the file and it should open up in your software. So there's this cool little thing here. We can drag that along. And that's how the paper folding kind of looks. But because this one is designed for teachers to present, I'm going to change it to computer view. So it's a little bit bigger. And you get this sort of an envelope. So you're getting the kids to fold it. And the more creases they make and they draw these lines in, and you get this lovely little envelope. We haven't proven that it's a parabola, but the reality is that's what it is. The other thing we get the kids to do, and let's just um, march my students back to the wall. This is an activity I used to have the students do. We get the students to line up across the back wall, and then we get them to walk away from the wall or put a chair or something in the middle of the room. Obviously, there'd be one and a half metres between each one of these students nowadays. And they just walk away from the wall, perpendicular to the wall, if you like. But each student has to stop when they believe they are the same distance from this object as they are from the wall. So this student over here on the far left would be going, oh, I'm a long way from the object. I need to keep on walking. The student here might be thinking, I'm getting pretty close. So that group in the middle kind of stop and go, yeah, we think we're about the same distance away. So we keep on walking. We have this lovely little curve that looks like that. And it is the very definition of a parabola that is a set of points that are equidistant from a fixed point, which we call the focus, and a straight line, which of course we call the directrix. So that's a nice little activity, and teachers can show it if they don't want the kids walking around. Here's the physical construction of it. So you can see our parabola y equals x squared. No, y equals, uh, yep, y equals x squared. And we see where the focus is, and we can see where the directrix is. So obviously students can manipulate these things and watch the focus and directrix buzz around. And there's teacher notes on how to use this file. Um, and if you gain, you can also get into, oh, here's a um, uh, 3D version of it. And you can manipulate it and see that the cross section that you're cutting through creates a parabola. That's out of our cone, of course. Yeah, conic sections, as it was called when I first studied it, Peter. That's it. That's correct. Mm. Um, are, are you able to show us? The, I'm just wondering, could you also show us the the worksheets, please, when you downloaded the, the package? Yep. So student activity. We won't go into teacher notes. We'll just have a look. What do the students? You know, you, you photocopy these off and give these out to the students, or email them if you're trying to save paper. And it says, OK, parabolas belong to a group of curves called conic sections. Let me just enlarge that a little. And it says, you know, it's more than a graph. And here's the Inspire file that the students get. And you create and a nice little trace of that curve. And if they haven't been to parks to see the dish, then I think they should. That's it. Or at least they should watch it on TV, yeah. right? In the movie. <laughs> yeah, watch the movie. Yeah, no, but it's, it's yeah. well actually on the strength of the movie, Peter. They actually got more funding um, to um, put more into the museum there. It's terrific. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I, again, yeah. again, I remember first going there when I was a kid, and uh, if, uh, yeah, that the museum is ten times the size. Oh, that's good. That's really yeah. good. So what a lot of people don't realise, they say that you know any. Um, ray parallel to the principal axis for the physics types reflects off the um, parabola and, and returns back through the focal point. But one of the things that people miss when they're talking about that is if we're thinking of a wave or if we're thinking of particles, depending on whether you're going wave or particle model, if a, let's imagine a particle is hitting that 
parabolic dish. And that particle could be part of a wave if we want to think of the dual idea of it. And it bounces back through the focal point and it will land at that focal point at exactly the same time as any other particle from the same crest of that wave passes through. And that's because of that distance property that the parabola has. So get that again, if a particle hits this edge, so let's suppose there's a wave front coming in, if a particle from that wave hits the reflector dish, it will come up to the focal point at exactly the same time as any other particle from that wave. And if you think about it, if it didn't, then the noise that you'd hear would be all garbled. You wouldn't get the same sound focused. But it all comes back to that property. So, you know, parabola is not just this U-shaped curve. It has so many really cool features. So the activity tries to dig into some of those really powerful features of a parabola, not just, you know, let's, mm -hmm. let's just draw this curve. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. So, Terrific yeah, stuff. The I was going to say, Peter, also at, at, at uh, parks, at the visitor centre there, I, I said museum, I should call it visitor centre, because a lot of it is, is interactive and there's films, uh, the shop, all sorts of goodies. But in the gardens, there's um, uh, a couple of parabolic dishes set up. Um, and I don't oh, know, they might nice. be about, yeah, yeah they not, might be about, I don't know, 60 metres apart. Um, and you can stand in one of them and your kid can be standing in another one 60 metres from you, but you're each at the focal point of the, of those dishes, which are concrete, I think. Um, and you can whisper and have a conversation. Like That's Science cool. Works. Yeah, something, um, yeah, yeah I was going to say Science Works. Yeah, Science Works has got the same yeah. thing. And, um, I used to teach at a school which is now closed down, unfortunately, many years ago, back in the 90s, and the local swimming pool had a, like a, almost like an inflated dome over the pool. And that inflated dome was very much in the shape of an ellipse. So mm -hmm. there was actually two points in the pool where you would, and, and I had one of my physics students analysed all the sound waves as they were bouncing around, and they found the two um, focal points so they could hear the person at the other focal point talking quite clearly, even though there was all this other noise going around in the pool. It was kind of weird. Um, and I remember the same thing when I was at uni, we were in one of these um, auditorium type things that had the same property, and I was listening to the lecturer talk, but in the background I could hear someone, I'm looking around me thinking, who on earth is talking? This is just so rude. And I was about to thump someone next to me, and I then recognised the voice, and they're sitting on the other side of the room. I thought, well, mm -hmm. that's kind of cool. That's yeah, yeah so it's, it's a sort of dodgy engineering for a lecture theatre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, just before I think we leave, it was the, the planetarium. If I if I remember correctly, it might have been the planetarium. So, uh, but you're right; it's kind of dodgy. They should have had some battles in there or something, right? Um, I'm just. Uh, would people are asking also? You've showed us those yep. lessons. Um, are there lessons for the other year levels? Uh, so the answer is yes, oh, uh, for, for years, yep. year eight, year nine. Um, what about primary, so year six? Uh, we haven't got anything for primary on our site, uh, mainly because that's our TI-15 model that most people would use. Having said that, um, if you want to extend the kids, that's actually a good question, Brian. Let me go back to our website and I'll jump into the year seven material because there's nothing wrong with taking particularly the STEM content. Um, uh -huh. There's a couple of really nice problems. So Goldback um, conjecture, for example. Uh, Colatz conjecture is another delightful problem uh, that you can have students explore. Uh, I think Colatz might actually be either in our year eight, let me just have a look, or year nine. Let me just have a little quick peek. Yep, coding in the hailstone problem. Uh, it's actually Colatz yep. conjecture. So teachers could download that activity. And it's basically, uh, I think some people know it as the uh, 3N plus 1 problem. And that is, if you choose any number you like, let's suppose we started with, um, I'm going to say, 21. If it's odd, you multiply it by 3 and add 1. 
So multiply 21 by 3, add 1, we get 64. If it's even, you divide it by 2, which makes it now 32. If it's even, which 32 is, we divide it by 2, we go back to 16. It's even, so we divide it by 2, we go back to 8. It's even, so we go back to 4, then 2, then 1. Colat said that will happen to every number, but nobody's ever proven it. So even though this activity is thrown in as a coding activity in year eight, because we get the kids to write a program to do it, there's no reason why in grade six you couldn't get the kids to do it by hand. In fact, if they're using the TI-15 calculator, it has two operations, OP1 and OP2. So you make OP1 three mm -hmm. times the current number plus one, you make operation two, divide by two, and then the kids just press up one, up two, up one, up two, and, and it tracks the trail of numbers as it goes. And if they draw a graph of that, you get something that looks very much like a coral, which is pretty cool. So yes, uh, I, I do take your point. Yeah. There's nothing on our grade six material, but yes, you can pinch some of these other activities, and there's resources in here that you could equally use uh, in measurement, geometry, number and algebra, probability and statistics that can translate. So um, this one here in year seven, facing your hand and plotting those as points. Oh, nothing wrong yeah, with kids yeah, in year seven, sure. uh, grade six doing that. Um, they literally just trace around their hand and, and plot those as points. So it's practicing plotting points. And then if they're clever that they'll you know draw the other side. You could do that on Excel, of course. You don't need the graphing calculator to do that if you didn't want to. Um, it's just really quick and easy. Uh, kids tend to stumble over some of the stuff in Excel. So let's mm. jump back. I think student tutorials was another one people asked for, wasn't it? Uh, yes, um, and, and also interest, yes, the student tutorials and also the student resources, so the actual student resources link on the website. Yep. Uh, uh, and also, also the 10 minutes of code, Peter, which is something that I would think, because that's so, um, I've enjoyed using that with students because a lot of it is um, self-directed. You just start them off and away they go. And I reckon, you know, some of your smarter year six students could get stuck right into that. Mm. We've yeah, had so one of our participants has said, let's start by trying N equals 27. Now I'm just going <laughs> to have a guess. I'm going to say that probably produces a string of about 91 numbers. So. Our person that suggested 27, let's see if I'm correct in my assumption. I think 119 is the longest sequence, which comes out for 97. Um, so some of the sequences, and that's just two-digit numbers. Once you go over two-digit numbers, uh, some of those sequences get pretty big. Hmm. Now, I've clicked on this video link. I'm not sure whether that's going to come up well on the uh, webinar, but this is part of our YouTube channel. So students can get here onto the video. This one is understanding. I'm just going to mute the sound because you don't want to hear me twice. Um, this one's graphs and their derivatives. So it's about understanding. And I'll show you where you can access that from our website because there's question sheets that go along with these. So you might find them on YouTube. But if you go onto our website and get it, you can download the question sheet as well. Sometimes you can get it by the little show more option and show less. Um, in this case, this one's just talking about gradient, talking relating that to a roller coaster, whether you're going uphill, downhill, whether you're at the top of the curve, and then eventually zero. And then it says, okay, well, let's, let's take the little visual away and put it back onto a graph. So it talks about the same sort of thing as what you just experienced on the roller coaster and says, well, let's do it on the calculator and translate that to uphill and downhill. So it's taking kids through the actual concept. And then once it's finished with our funny little roller coaster, it'll remove the background and just draw the graph. And of course, if you do the gradient activity on our website, it has something similar to this where you can drag it along and see the, the slope of the curve as it goes. Let's pause him. Where do we find it? Let's go into students. So there's getting started, there's the tutorial series, which is what we're about to look at, and there's also a section on prepare for exams. Which Might is very good. Early in the year for that. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it might be a little bit early in the year, but no. Uh, there we go. So under tutorials, student tutorials, we can register for new ones. Um, I need to get rid of the follow us on the student blog because I think that's closed now that COVID uh, learn or remote learning has finished. So we'll do state, uh, let's say, let's do something for the Queenslanders that have joined us. And let's try methods. And you can select whether you're using an 84 or an Inspire or Inspire CAS, because up in Queensland, they can use that one as well. They just got to make sure they turn off CAS for the exams. Um, and understanding, oh, look at this, how to graph the gradient of a function, understanding the graph of the gradient function. So that one's just play the video, but how to graph it, they play the video, which shows them how to do it. And then there's a question sheet. So they can download the question sheet and that has some answers on them as well. Um, there's some other ones like how to use a calculator, like 10 keyboard shortcuts. Those ones are particularly popular. I think they've been up for less than a year and they've had a couple of thousand hits on those ones. Um, understanding the factor and remainder theorem. And then there's a question sheet, which you can download to go along with it. Those question sheets so, themselves are a terrific resource. Um, you know, you could put them, you could put them together in a book that they're, they're a very well developed resource. And of course, uh, knowing that you've got videos that you can watch, tut video tutorials that you can watch that will actually talk you through the solutions. So not all of them, but the, f the first uh, first half a dozen or so in each. Yeah. So, for example, um, this is the factor and remainder theorem one. Um, that QR code will take you straight to the video. So if you photocopied this and gave it out to your students, because, of course, you can do that freely, um, no worries about breach of copyright. You just hand it out to your students um, or email it to them. And if they scan that, I think most people are familiar with QR codes now, the video will pop up on this topic. Um, so the first one is relatively simple. Given f of 3 equals 0, determine one of the factors of the polynomial f of x. And it's interesting because we don't give them the, the polynomial, so we're not asking them to do any algebra or anything. We just say, well, you know, use the definition um, to come up with that. This one's an interesting one. If f of x equals this thing, change the value of the constant, that is the 13, so that x minus 5 is a factor of f of x. So we're going to change this number here so that x minus 5 is a factor. So a slightly different question you might normally get. Um, if f of x equals g of x times h of x and g of 4 equals 0, determine the value of f of 4. So some of the questions are a little unusual. Perhaps not what you get in the textbook. Um, and then, of course, there's answers for them here and how they can solve them. So that's our student section. Lots of tutorials. And there's the graph of the derivative function one. Now, what was the other one you said was um, 10 minutes of code. We're kind of working through it anyway, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. All righty. So we'll, we'll jump on the website and just show you where it is, and then we'll have a quick look at this one, because this is one of my favourite, all-time favourite sequences. It's, I know Fibonacci sequence ties in with um, golden ratio and the metallic ratios, the bronze and whatever, and, and there's some beautiful connections with sums of cubes and sums of squares and uh, permutations and combinations. It's all come out of this Fibonacci sequence, but... This is one of my favourites because of the surprise element. It's so cool. I'll show you that one in a minute. In the meantime, let's just jump back onto the website so you'll see where to get these coding exercise. TI codes there in students. Same little link there for teachers. And there we can see you can code in Python or BASIC. We haven't put the Lua ones on there. Um, there are websites that have uh, how to do the work in, in uh, Lua. So you pick which product you want to use, and you can also use the Innovator Hub if you're using that in Rover. So let's suppose I'm using a TI-84, and then start here. So you can see it's pretty straightforward. Programming basics, displaying on the screen. Step by so step. Skill Builder 1. 
Yeah, step by step. And then here we go. Select new, use the arrow keys. Select create by pressing enter. So it tells you, you know, press the program key, press new, etc. Step two. Hello, Exe. Looks that looks like they've left out the S. Hello, Foxy. Right? Um, yeah. Hello, X Y. Mm. So yeah, very very simple, straightforward sort of stuff. So let's go back now to my do, favorite. Do you do have Sorry, to indicate that the the um, whenever I show that to people, I I state the uh, the rider that um, the the addiction warning. It's not ten oh, yes. minutes of it. You will be that's hooked right. in ten minutes. Um, and you better have a few hours free ahead of you because you'll be you'll be stuck on it and you'll you'll just want to keep going. And <laughs> yeah, that's one of the ones where the bell goes and the students want to stay. <laughs> uh, and just yeah, and Peter also, what we got from home. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, Python. Some people have been asking. Oh, it's okay, not, it's not my top level. Why not? To our codes. It's going to go slow now, isn't it? There it goes. So Python programming. But, but I haven't uh, got that on my hand, Peter. Ah, all you need to do is, uh, good question, all you need to do is update your handheld. How do I do that? Uh, you make sure you have the latest software on your computer and the operating system for the calculator is embedded in the software. So you don't have to do a separate download. If you've got the latest version of the software, then you just connect your calculator. It will tell you that the operating system is old and give you the option to update, which you can do. Uh, in fact, we've got videos, tutorials on our YouTube channel showing you how mm -hmm. to update the operating system of your calculator. Um, so, yes, it, it, it's all downloaded when you download the software, which is why we say to people, make sure the kids don't throw out their software license. Make sure they keep it and install it. It's so powerful to have it. Um, so, yeah, there's your Python ones, and you'll see it's still titled 10 Minutes of Code. I've gone through the first couple of lessons on getting started with Python. Uh, pretty straightforward. Add new page, add Python. Uh, it um, opera, uh, opens in this what we call an editor shell. If you've never used Python, that might be something a little bit weird that you've not seen before. It looks scary. It's not because it takes you through step by step. So it uh -huh. says add Python. It's one of the new options in the operating system. Add Python, new, give it a name, print hello world, and then input, output, print, etc. And it prints out hello world. Mm -hmm. And what if I need, want to learn a little bit more about programming in Python, and I just happen to be free on Tuesday the 2nd of <laughs> March, at uh, seven o'clock Eastern Summer Time, I know what I'd be doing. Thank I would you. join the webinar uh, that's going to be presented then. So that's the second of March, uh, Sanjeev Meston, and uh, Introduction to Python with the TI Inspire CX2 technology. So where you registered for this event, uh, and I'll type I'll type it into the chat now. Uh, you can register for that now as well. Alrighty, strap yourselves in for my favourite sequence. It's called Fly Straight. I didn't create this. This is one that I found on a YouTube video, and I thought, oh my lord, I have to share this with people. So yeah, I'm one of those nuts that watches all these. You know, I, I go to a gym and they've got these screens on the the treadmill. So I'm like this little rat running in a, a little hamster running in a wheel. And I just put on all of these maths videos and I, I get some running done while I'm uh, watching. I, I just feel sorry for the person that gets on after me. You know, they look at it and go, what, what sort of a crackpot was watching this? <laughs> all the suggested videos coming up as maths videos. All right, so cutting to the chase. All right. If the highest common factor between N plus 1 and TN is equal to 1, then... We do this. Otherwise, we do that. That looks scary, but it's not. So basically what it's saying is, what is the highest common factor between the next term number? So if n equals 1, then what is the highest common factor between 2 and term 1? 
Well, the highest common factor is one. So we follow this rule that says do one plus two plus this extra one to get four. So there's our two values that we're looking at. Highest common factor is one. So our statement is true. So we follow that rule, which gives us a result of four. Hmm. Not exciting yet. We call these recursive relationships, of course. This time it's true again. The highest common factor between three and four is still one. So we're still following this rule here, which says we'll do four plus three plus one will give us eight. And hopefully some people have already realized what's gonna happen next. Highest common factor between eight and four is four. So it's not one, therefore we don't do this bit. We do the else statement. And that is we divide eight by the highest common factor, four, to land at two. And we move along to the next one. Highest common factor between two and five is one, so we do two plus five plus one is eight. But you can see the algorithm itself. It's, it's one if statement, and then just keep on adding into this sequence. So highest common factor between eight and six is two, so we'll do eight divided by two to get four, and so on. That's the entire program. That was quick, I wrote that pretty quickly, huh? You can see it's kind of ugly, but highest common factor is written as GCD, credits common divisor, and you can see it's looking for the highest common factor. So these things are lists. So my value for N is stored in a list and my terms are stored in a list. So it says, what's the highest common factor between the next term number and your current term? If it's one, then do this. Otherwise, do this. So it adds on this new term or adds on this new term and then just goes back again. It says, how many times would you like to do this? And there's a graph of the first 25 terms. So let's go back to my software. So I've graphed the first 50 terms. Isn't that exciting? Is that just like the coolest graph you've ever seen? Well, for our South Australian viewers, the coolest graph. Now, the Western Australians, if there's any Western Australians on here, do you say graph as well? I believe they do, don't they? Let's do 200 terms, shall we? What do you see how cool this is? Go menu and, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've got the prototype of the software, folks, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to crash on me. You're trying to do too much at once there, Peter. Oh, no, there it is. Yep. Uh, it, it, it won't go down to it. I'll try option one, option five. No, it's not going to do it. What I'll do is I'll do it on here. There's the first 600 terms. Still not very exciting, is it? But you will not believe what happens once you get up to about 630 terms. I, if anyone knows what happens, put it in the chat if you like. Um, but you can actually do that in Excel, by the way, or you can do it in the um, spreadsheet on the calculator. You don't even need to um, use programming if you don't want to. Uh, you can actually just drop mm -hmm. it straight in. Yep, yep, with uh, cell referencing, yep. Yep, correct. Uh, now, someone's so, asked what it looked like as a box plot. Oh, I haven't thought of it as a box plot. I'm thinking it would just get bigger and bigger and bigger, but that's because I know what happens after term number 620-something. I won't say exactly what term it is, but... Yeah, it, it will totally blow you. I mean, it's kind of a clue in the title, fly straight. Um, but again, it's, when, when you get there, you're just like, oh, I did not see that coming. That And there's a lovely talk by um, the, the gentleman that does the, I think it's called Tree Blue One Brown, and he talks about building the story when you're teaching mathematics and the element of surprise and how much that awakens kids' interest in mathematics. 
And to me, that's one of them. That when you get there, it's like, whoa, he does this beautiful one. I'm trying to think of the, the gentleman's name. Uh, he does this beautiful one where he's got a block colliding with another block and he makes the the first block bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's it's heading towards a wall and it basically sandwiches a small block. So the small block kind of gets trapped between the big block and the wall. But as it mm-hmm. rebounds repeatedly with the wall, eventually it imparts enough energy to make the big block turn around and go back in the other direction. And eventually they stop colliding. But he counts the number of collisions as the block gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the number of collisions tends towards a multiple of pi. Uh And then it generates the value pi. And you just look at that and go, we're talking about collisions of blocks and a wall. How on earth does pi suddenly come out of that? And that's pretty cool. And that's where he says, Mm. that's that element of surprise. And that's what that particular sequence does as well. When you get there, you'll go, oh, I didn't see it coming. Now, so Peter, by all means, try that people, out. people wanting to do that activity, um, where can we find it? Yep. Is that this oh, is one of the very activities? Very good question. I'm glad you asked, Brian. Let's go back to the website. And you'd think that would probably be in the Australian curriculum stuff, wouldn't you? And then you'd be correct. So when you go in here, you saw before these, these little STEM options. And there's options for, in this case, coding. Let's jump into year nine, because this is sort of a year nine thing to do. Um, So when the kids have done the 10 minutes of coding stuff, there's extra lessons that you can do here. So you can check credit cards and see how the numbers are checked and validated. There's a little algorithm that they use. Uh, There's another little algorithm here, converting numbers into binary. I know your calculator can do it, but it's good for the kids to do it. And this is the fly straight one. Uh huh. So year nine codes. Yep. Well, STEM. Yep, STEM. Oh, and okay. coding. I'm STEM coding. Yep. So what does the student activity look like? It's just downloading now. So it gets them to do the the first bit by hand, so they kind of get the gist of how this sequence is working. And says, okay, well, let, let's code it up. And, and it goes through the instructions on how to code it and check little things on the calc commands like greatest common divisor, how does that work? And then it says, okay, now we're ready for the decision-making process using this if, then, else sort of a statement. And there's a program that you saw on the screen before and a sample of what it should look like when they start generating the sequence. And it says, you know, once you're finished here, um, uh, let me see, terms or term numbers that are prime numbers, relative abundance of primes and composite numbers present in the sequence. So there's a few other things that the kids can go uh, through and have a look to see what's happening with it. Because, you know, we, we find a lot of really cool things from the Fibonacci sequence. There's a few others come out of this as well. Now, I'm just watching the time, Brian. Mm. Um, I think we're right on the money in terms of... Uh, what we can get through. Uh, I just want to show this one little last one in the dying minutes of the session. TI Innovator Hub, and obviously you can use it to control motors, pumps, and temperature and humidity and all sorts of things. So here's one I did just the other day. I was sort of playing around with it this afternoon before we uh, came on here. I've connected up. I've got some of my old Lego Technic stuff that they used to use in schools many years ago as in the old stuff, don't throw it out, because you can actually control these motors from your calculator. There's something called a MOSFET, and all the instructions are in that 10 minutes of code section. And you can see it's been doing a little spirograph. So I've got one motor turning this thing around and another motor popping this arm backwards and forwards. And you can see it's in the process of drawing a spirograph, which is kind of cool. Um, Or... Went to a conference um, back in the days when we could travel overseas and some teachers and students did some 3D printing and built a working hand. So the hand actually opens and closes and you can get it to grip because you can control each finger and the thumb. Um, And you can see TI Innovators just connected with a whole bunch of wires um, and and they made a 3D hand, a bionic hand. I think that was pretty cool. 
And now we are at um, at seven fifty nine on my my clock. So that's all we have for you, folks. Hopefully you got some uh, ideas out of it. You got a bit of a trip through the website and a few maths activities, and now you know where to download them. So that's back Terrific. To you, right? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you once again, Peter. Um, and from the amount of chat there, obviously uh, people are pretty keen to take a further look at those resources. Now, remember, you've got to go to bed tonight, especially if you've got school tomorrow. So I don't want people staying up <laughs> all night uh, on the website doing these resources. Um, but yeah, but hopefully, as I said before, hopefully you've uh, had a, a good good start to the school year already, and uh, that um, this might make it just a, a little bit more exciting. And I know kids are excited to be back after the debacle that last year was. So uh, hopefully this is helping you along. And I'm hoping, of course, that you join us more for our webinar program. Remember, I've already made the, given the plug to uh, Sam Jeeves' webinar, Tuesday 2nd of March, and that will be on the Python programming. Keep an eye on the newsletters uh, and register for those. Uh, if you do have any last minute questions, now's the time to write to type them in, and Peter can read those directly. Uh, make sure you direct them to, to Peter or to all panellists. Um, as I said, in the feedback, uh, one of the main things that we would like to hear from you, please, when you do that survey, what would you like to see in the program this year? For example, would you like to, to see us continue with the student tutorial program, which was huge last year? Um, would you like to see the see the, the TI codes competition again this year? Uh, that was uh, that that was we had a huge response to that last year, and some great work done by teams on the coding competition, that was term four. Um, so any of that sort of stuff, of course, you will get your follow-up email and certificate of attendance that you can print out uh, for your PD portfolio. If you want to watch all of this again, it's available both through the on-demand section on our website um, within the webinars or on YouTube as well. So take a look. I'm hoping you've already bookmarked the TI Australia YouTube station. Um, the newsletter, of course, if you haven't already subscribed to that, I rec strongly recommend you do to keep up to speed with everything new that's coming along. Um, and of course, we're also available on the phones. So that's it. Once again, thank you, Peter. And Thanks, Brian. good night. Yeah, terrific. And uh, look forward to getting into more exciting things as our year unfolds. Good evening to all.